My uh, discussion is going to be why perioperative uh, therapy might cure kidney cancer. And uh, here are my disclosures. And what I'm going to, uh, Rob just uh, elucidated a little bit of this, but perioperative therapy is treatment that we give either before, during, or after surgery. And it's usually, in the case of kidney cancer, limited to the kidney uh, area, but Len Appleman later in the day will um, talk about some other situations where we might cut out uh, metastases and include those treatments. So uh, this was also shown. This is uh, the NCCN guidelines. These are guidelines that we use for treating cancer, and these are developed by um, experts all over the country, and they review the most recent research and, and data and make uh, uh, decisions, and these decisions help to advise both insurance companies and also um, uh, drug companies um, and also practicing physicians how we do these. So this is, uh, we have pages and pages of these guidelines, but um, what I want to point out here are, are really that if it's an earlier stage disease, uh, you know, most of the treatments are either cutting out part of the kidney or um, watching a mass if it's very small or sticking a needle into the area and either freezing it or heating it up. And if it's a bigger tumor, it's taking things out. But you can see that uh, the other thing that, uh, that we're doing more and more is, as Dr. Uzo uh, elaborated, is uh, clinical trials that are around these earlier uh, but, mo but more high-risk disease. So surveillance, uh, in, in any case after you've had the kidney or the kidney tumor removed, if it's an early stage disease, we generally recommend watching uh, with scans every six months for the first year. These are very small tumors, and then once a year for up to five years. But if, it's, uh, if, the, if the cancer is bigger, it's either bigger than uh, seven centimeters, so you know, bigger than a baseball, um, or it has lymph nodes or, you know, something else, then the recommendations are to get imaging every three to six months for the first three years, and then once a year for at least two years. And sometimes if we have a very young patient, we might even advocate watching it uh, a little bit longer. And the preferred imaging is either a CAT scan or an MRI of the abdomen and a CAT scan of the chest. If it's an earlier stage, we might use chest x-rays uh, in place of things. So the drugs that we've used in these perioperative clinical trials can be kind of um, uh, defined as either what we call the VEGF TKIs, vascular endothelial growth factor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And these are some of the drugs that have been used in that setting, and these are drugs that target blood vessels. And the other drugs that, um, and these trials have all been completed, and, and I'm able to go over the results of this. And then the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are um, drugs that are given intravenously and stimulate your immune system. And so I've listed the drugs in this country and in Canada that we're using. There are a couple of other drugs that are being used in the United States kingdom also in, in um, uh, this kind of setting. And so this is a map of the line, landscape of kidney cancer. And what you can see here are, um, this is the, these are the, uh, the genes that cause blood vessels to uh, develop. And kidney cancer is full of blood vessels. When you saw that uh, video of the surgery, you could see there was a lot of, of bleeding and, and Kidney cancers in general are very vascular. And so half of our tool chest is going after the blood vessels and cutting off the blood supply to the tumor. And then the other part is um, attacking or directing the immune system, I should say. So it, the, the drugs for the immune system, which are listed down here, are drugs that actually tell your immune system to be a little bit more surveillant in your body. So what they do is they 
tell your, um, your lymphocytes to not just recognize if you have an infection and not just recognize if you have a virus. You know, when you get a virus, you sometimes feel a little achy and you get better on your own. You don't need any antibiotics because your, your body's uh, immune system is taking care of that. So what these immune therapies do is they teach your body to look for things, not just bacteria, but to look for things that are really foreign in the body. And so cancer is foreign. So some of these new IV therapies aren't actually treating directly the cancer. They're telling your body to help contain the cancer. And the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Bill Kalin just this Monday. And he was actually here speaking at a research conference yesterday. And his work was based on um, identifying these, the, the, um, the vascular, the blood vessel pathway, and the role of oxygen. And this is a new drug um, that was called, from a company called Peloton, and Merck just bought this drug uh, from Peloton a couple of months ago. And this is, this is another new uh, cancer. And I think um, uh, Dr., uh, one of the other, Doctors is going to uh, speak about this. Camila Porta is going to mention that drug uh, later on today. So um, the drugs that target the blood vessels are very active in metastatic kidney cancer. And uh, roughly 80% of patients, if their disease is spread, are going to get some benefit from these drugs. About 20% of, uh, and this is clear cell of the kidney that I'm talking about, and Dr. Narayan will be talking about uh, non-clear cell a little bit later this morning. But uh, roughly 20% of patients don't respond to these drugs in the metastatic setting. And, and so that's one of the challenges that we have is figuring out what are the right drugs for the, for the particular patient and situation. Um, but the use of uh, these drugs, the VEGF TKIs, is kind of remains still controversial in the adjuvant setting. And there have so far been five uh, clinical trials in, in kind of high-risk kidney cancer, not kidney cancer that's been metastasized and cut out, but, but kidney cancer that's either a bigger tumor, or it's in the lymph nodes, or it's extending into the renal vein. And so what I've done is I've listed all of these trials here. These are the names of the trial, but these are the drugs that were used. So you know these as Sutent, or Nexavar, uh, or Votriant, or Enlita. Um, and we know them as, as these uh, generic names. And these are um, what we call disease-free survival curves. So this is comparing one arm uh, that is the patient that got a placebo to, oops, sorry about that. Um, uh, to, uh, to the other arms. And when the curves are close together here, what that means is you didn't really see any, no, any difference. Everybody did the same. And so out of these, there's only one trial out of the five that did show a difference. And that was this um, the Pfizer trial of sunitinib versus placebo. And what that trial showed was that patients who took sunitinib for a year uh, were able to delay their cancer coming back as a, as a group by roughly a year. Um, what I'm not showing here, uh, because all of these articles don't necessarily show the, the um, the overall survival curves uh, in a way that I could put them all on the same slide. But all of these other trials, everybody did the same. There was no difference between the drugs. And so there's quite a bit of controversy because here's a big trial where we didn't see a difference using Sutent. This trial with uh, Votriant, we didn't see a difference. We didn't see a difference in, in Lyda, even if you give it up to six or three years after treatment. And, and this was just presented last week at the European Society of Medical Oncology with serafinib, either a year or three years, we didn't see a difference. But when you look at this as far as is it curing people and is it changing overall survival, none of these five trials showed a difference in overall survival. So this is a little bit confusing for patients because we have one trial that did show a benefit and then these other trials that didn't. So, you know, why is that? And some of those reasons probably could be patient selection, 
but some of them probably have to do with tumor bi biology, and some of them probably have to do with the fact that these drugs need to act on blood vessels. And so if you've taken the cancer out and you don't have a lot of cancer vessels to work against, these drugs just may not work that well in that setting. Um, and, and so some of the ways we've tried to figure that out are looking at, so this is the Votrian study. So half the patients got Votrian, half the patients got placebo. And what we did see was in, a, in some patients, if their drug levels of Votrian got up to a certain point, uh, they did benefit. But the problem is when we went back and looked at um, the doses patients got, it didn't really correspond to the dose the patient got. So it has something to do with the biology. So there may be some people out there that get benefit from these drugs, but we don't really have a good handle on that. And the other thing that's a little bit troubling about these studies is this is a, a chart of side effects. And so what, what we mean by a grade three side effect is it's something that really involves interrupting the dose or um, having to come off of treatment um, or lowering the dose. And what you can see with these trials, and Emily Feld will be talking about side effects a little bit later in the morning or in the afternoon, is that roughly 60 percent of patients on every single one of these trials had pretty significant side effects. And that's a little different from these drugs in the advanced disease setting. Um, in the advanced disease setting, these drugs often make people feel better. But in the adjuvant setting, what it did is a lot of people felt much more tired. They had peeling of their hands. They had diarrhea. They had mouth sores. And if, if they're not sure whether it's helping, you know, there's one trial that is, is helping you delay your disease recurrence for a year. But if, if you're feeling bad that whole year and it's not curing you, maybe that isn't what you want to do. So if you go and talk to different doctors all over the country here, you're going to get different recommendations. And those are based on those NCCN guidelines. And the NCCN guidelines clearly say that Sutent is an, is an approved drug in this setting. You could certainly take it for a year based on the one study. But just know that there are a lot of other studies that kind of didn't show that. And so people are really on the fence um, about you know, whether, whether to use that in this setting. And, and everybody's going to be different. And there's still a little bit of, of data that we're waiting for. This is the Everest study. Some of you may have participated. This is a completely different mechanism of action. Um, it's an mTOR inhibitor, so it, it's not the same as these other trials. And this one hasn't reported out yet, but it's, it's no longer enrolling patients. So we, we wait to find out the results of that. So what I wanted to primarily talk about now are clinical trials that are open now and some of the ongoing work with immune therapy. So immune checkpoint inhibitors are pembrolizumab, which is also known as Keytruda and nivolumab, which is known as Optivo, and then Uruvoy, uh, or, or ipilimumab, which is known as uh, Uruvoy, and uh, tezolizumab, which is uh, Tecentric, T-centric. Um, so these are drugs you may, you know, while you're watching TV, you may hear advertisements and stuff for this. And what these new immune checkpoint inhibitors have done that Betsy Plimick is going to be talking about in advanced disease is they've, they've really become a very active part of our toolbox in treating advanced kidney cancer. And so now there are trials looking at these in the adjuvant setting and also in the neoadjuvant setting to see if they help kidney cancer. And so these are two trials that you can't enroll on, mainly because they've already finished and we're waiting for the results to come back. But this was the EMOTION trial and the Keynote 564. And Emotion looked at T-centric versus a placebo. So patients would get an infusion after they had surgery and they were at high risk. Um, they would get a, a year of this treatment in the vein every three months or an equivalent placebo. And the Keynote trial did the same thing, pretty much the same eligibility criteria. And that one you got Keytruda for every three weeks in the vein 
for, uh, for a year. And what was different about these trials uh, than, than the ones that I was speaking about before is patients really feel very good on these drugs. So it's very hard for us to even know whether they're on the real drug or, or that. And, and you might, that might be a little bit spooky. You might say, well, um, you know, I'm not sure I want to get stuck, you know, in the arm with a vein, you know, in the vein uh, for a year getting a, a saline versus uh, uh, the real thing. But, but that's really how we learn because we, we treat everybody the, the same and uh, we follow everybody the same. So these trials, we're waiting to get that information. And what we're hoping to get with that information is that they're curing more patients with kidney cancer. Um, but there are two other trials that are open and accruing, and this is the checkmate. This is uh, um, Optivo with Yervoy, uh, which is nivolumab or ipilimumab versus placebo again. And we don't have this open, but this is open at Lehigh Valley Hospital. It's open at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it's open at the Jersey Shore at uh, one of the hospitals. Um, and this gives six months of this combination therapy or a placebo. Um, so that's, that's another option. If you've had kidney cancer surgery and you're within uh, 12 weeks of your surgery and it's considered high risk. However, we do have a trial open here, um, and this is open at Fox Chase, and this is open in a lot of other hospitals in the area. And this is a, this is a, this is a trial that you can have your surgery pretty much everywhere. You just, if you participated in the trial, you would need to go to a place where the actual clinical trial is open, but you could still have your surgery done uh, with whichever surgeon that you prefer anywhere. It doesn't have to be at those hospitals. And this is asking a very important question, and that is that we think that these drugs might actually work better if you have a little bit of cancer in there to start with. And so this is a trial that is called the PROSPER trial, and it's, acting, it's asking if you give a little bit of immune therapy ahead of time and then take the kidney out or the kidney tumor out and then give some more immune therapy, does that work better uh, than if you just give it in the pure adjuvant setting? And the rationale for that is um, that we've seen this in, in other cancers like uh, triple negative breast cancer and lung cancer. And so there have been trials, in, and especially lung cancer, which is on this side. If you give these drugs ahead of time, uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that patients got two doses of Optivo before they had their lung cancer operated on, and nearly half of the patients had um, a lot of the cancer go away with just those first two doses. And that's why we designed this trial to be uh, set up that way where some of the treatment is done ahead of time. So this is the PROSPER trial. And this is open here, and it's open at Fox Chase. And um, there's two arms to this trial. And we had patients, uh, including Deb Maskins, who's here at this conference, help uh, design this trial. But basically, anybody who's diagnosed with a cancer where the, where the cancer looks like it's a little bit bigger than a baseball, so seven centimeters, um, and it looks like it hasn't spread. It can be in the lymph nodes. It could be in the vein. Um, or, and it, it might have spread a little bit, but as long as the surgeon thinks they can take it all out with that surgeon, uh, with that surgery, you're eligible. And so there's two arms to this trial, and that's because we have to compare to standard of care. So one arm of the study is just regular standard of care, which is you go, um, you, you decide you're willing to go with either arm of the trial, and you sign a consent, and you get some blood work, and you get some scans to make sure that, that the cancer is, is what we think it is, that it hasn't spread widely. And um, we're, you're assigned um, by a computer nationally to either get arm A or arm B. If you're assigned to arm B, what you do is you just go straight to your regular surgery, and then we follow you exactly like, uh, very closely like we do for standard of care, which in this case is about every three, three to four months that we're doing scans. But if you're randomized to arm B, or arm A rather, you have to have a biopsy first of your kidney tumor, and then 
you get one dose of Optivo and then you go right to surgery. So that whole time frame really only takes about two and a half weeks. So it's not really delaying your surgery, um, but you're getting a dose ahead of time. Then you go and have your surgery and then you get once a month a dose of nivolumab or Optivo. And the patients like this because, um, and the patient advocates, because nobody really likes getting a placebo and that way you know exactly what you're getting. And, uh, and so we think this is a very important trial to accrue to. And uh, it's a little bit complicated because you have to meet with a medical oncologist at the same time that you're seeing the urologist. But, um, but, but you know, we all work together very well with this. And, and so this is definitely uh, something that we can get people to surgery quickly, but also offer you something else. So here are my conclusions. Um, and, uh, you know, mainly there's no overall survival benefit from the, the VEGF TKI trials, but there was uh, a benefit to one of the studies uh, in relapse free survival, so delaying relapse, and that was with adjuvant sutent. And uh, our concern is just that these adjuvant uh, VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the in, in that setting, in the adjuvant setting, seem to have a lot of side effects. We're not seeing those kinds of side effects to a great degree um, in uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so these are trials that uh, you could participate in, but uh, your other choices are also surveillance is still a very reasonable standard of care, and adjuvant sutent is, is an option. So thank you very much.